Well, first of all, hi, and thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me to talk about your new record. How have you been this last one year and a half? Everywhere, really. I think um, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? I think um, all of us have been ups and downs. At first, it seemed like I quite enjoyed it because introverts quite enjoy the the opportunity to spend uh, large chunks of time on their own and be away from all the noise and the clamour. But then, of course, you can only take so much of that. Um, but then when we started doing the album about halfway through the lockdown, uh, so that was great. And then this, this uh, girl here, uh, she's called Boogie. She's, she's really helped as well. Yeah, I noticed you got a new puppy on your Instagram account. Well, she's not a puppy anymore, I guess, but <laughs> must have been very interesting to be able to spend so much time with her as well. Well, she ended up playing a starting role in our, our video, Justice Girl. Uh, we shot um, two, two, well, three, we actually shot three videos in my village where I live um, in, in Somerset. I, I moved out of London during the lockdown to live in a cottage in the countryside. And it's a very sweet part of the English countryside with lots of history, not far from places like Glastonbury, Ave, Avesbury, um, lots of history around here, uh, medieval history and um, ancient history. So that's been interesting. Uh, but anyway, um, just to get back to the thing, yeah, we, we, we shot three uh, videos um, in my village here with an Italian friend of mine called Alberto who has a company called Arepo Films and I um, co-produced and co-wrote the videos with him and that's Jossie's Girl, Nobody Can See Me Cry and the new song It's Love Jim which just came out yesterday. And just to finish, uh, we, we, uh, the, the uh, videos were, were shot on um, Six, six on 16 millimeter using a Bolex camera. Um, Alberto is a very um, old world and um, likes to use all vintage equipment. Yeah, that's actually interesting. That was going to be one of my questions. Um, but what I also wondered was how much you were involved in the process of these videos, because I guess for the darkness, videos are kind of an important thing. You always include a lot of humor in your videos as well. So what is the process there from A to Z? Well, this time the guys um, handed it over to me really, and I was really um, pleased that they did that and quite touched that they, um, well, I'm not sure if they trusted me, but they handed it over anyway. And I worked on the videos with Alberto. Usually it's, it's not like that. Uh, uh, on the last campaign, it was more Justin's um, concepts and ideas for the videos, like Rock and Roll Deserves to Die with the Baldwigs, which was um, like a little kind of genius idea, I thought, you know, having us in Baldwigs. Because, you know, to prick um, the vanity of a, of a rock and roll is, is the hardest thing, you know? So that's a challenge, you know? So that was a challenge last time. And then this time it's a challenge because it's working with old-fashioned film equipment and doing everything ourselves so we kept it very tight you know we didn't have a big crew around us it was just james holcomb director of photography alberto directing my 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 partner diane birch did did the um wardrobe hair and makeup she's an american singer songwriter and she also collaborated on the the last track in the album which is called uh, The Speed of the Night Time. Yeah, you mentioned in the beginning, actually, that you quite enjoyed um, the pandemic at first because you're quite an introvert. And actually, in the, the music video of Nobody Can See Me Cry, I guess you're the kind of person in the video that's acting a little bit different than the guys. Is that sort of your dynamic in the band as well? I guess maybe I'm the stoic. <laughs> Do you use that word? Oh, well, yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> but also, also because I was brought up in Scotland too, so the Scottish are notoriously um, 
kind of locked up you know but i guess also because it was the, the contrast is quite important if all four of us had been uh um gratu gratuitous sorry what's the word gratuitous how do you say that gratuitous gratuitously crying um then i think uh, that would have been a bit tiresome so it was good that we were all true to ourselves for example i think it's not necessarily a good thing i think that americans have created this culture where everybody is inside out pouring all of their insides and their emotions i'm sure that you understand where i'm coming from because you're finnish and and the Scottish probably have some similarities with Finnish people in that they use um, alcohol and uh, strange humour to release their demons. Like, I think you mentioned as well, like in American culture, um, one of the things that you guys have kind of been doing since day one is to involve humour and comedy in, in your music and in your music videos as well. And I think, especially nowadays, that's maybe not so done so much anymore in rock music. Like everyone is so serious and then all that kind of stuff. But do you think that's also a cultural thing that you guys coming from UK and, you know, this British comedy world kind of? Yeah, I think so. I think in British culture, <laughs> it comes from the theatre, from the music hall and the vaudeville. It's always been this um, idea of, men dressing up in women's clothes and putting on makeup and just having fun raiding your mother's um, dressing closet when you're a child that's all part of the, uh, the childhood of artistic um, british males and thank goodness for that because otherwise i think without that i think rock and roll uh, would have become corporate rock a lot quicker and that's obviously the enemy and that's the worst thing one of the most awful uh, byproducts of western consumerism is uh, corporate culture and then corporate rock it makes me sick to the stomach well in fact you know something i wouldn't even say it makes me sick because i don't even because it's not even strong enough to even create a reaction. It's just nothing. It's just it's just sterility. It's completely sterile. It's just sad. That's all. Now going back to to the new record, of course, uh, I watched an interview before this with Justin. Uh, I think it was with Rock Sound, and he mentioned that the songwriting um, it was done remotely this time around, and in a way for him it was freeing because he mentioned that when you're four together songwriting you always kind of end up compromising uh how was the experience for you in that sense i think that's a fair comment what he said it's nice to mix things up it worked i think for each of cancelled for us all to work towards this common goal you could almost say we created a common goal by coming up with this concept album idea and having the title first but this time, I think it was good to do it differently. And like Justin said, I think it was a good thing that we um, wrote remotely. Because then there's a lot more of our individual identities in there and none of us watered down. So hence why it's quite an eccentric album, uh, very visceral and instinctive, which is nice. I would say it's the opposite of overthinking. We, we probably did the least thinking on this album and probably the most thinking on our previous album, Easter is Cancelled. So really, that demonstrates that we um, we always go off on a different tangent from the previous album. That's the only way we need to keep ourselves stimulated and keep our fans stimulated. Our, our fans get, get frustrated. Occasionally, you know, um, I might just have a little look on a little... Uh, social media just you know poke my nose in to see what they're talking about just one once in a while and i can see it causes frustration and they don't often get what we're doing but and they don't like everything we do 
but that's okay because we give them some of what they know they like and some of what they don't know they like they like it also seemed like uh, I think both of you mentioned that this record came together pretty fast in a span of like four months. Was this the fastest record or process behind an album you went through as a band? Definitely. You can almost say it was came off the top of our heads a lot of it, but that's pretty cool, I think, the top of our heads. But I think that's, um, maybe we should have called the album that, the top of our heads. <laughs> uh, I remember um, we did have one quite intense jamming session, you could call it a writing time, where myself, Rue and Dan got together in Cornwall and we jammed for, it was really just two days and we came up with really um, six, maybe se seven of the backing tracks that included in the 12 um, in the bonus track package. So over half the album really in terms of musically was created over this two day period and it was really riffing it was really you know dan's riffing and rue being very um explorative and imaginative with his drumming um really expressing himself you know that created like probably the biggest drum sound we've got on this album and some of the best heavy riffing as well which are obviously the specialities of dan and rue what are some of your favorite bass parts on this record? I notice actually the album starts with a bass riff, uh, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, but are there any other moments that you think are particularly cool that you came up with or are playing? Yeah, I think Speed of the Nighttime started off with bass. I was just messing around at home with my partner and she put down some finger drums. That's Diane Birch, I was telling you about before. She's an American singer songwriter. So we we don't normally do stuff together because she's more of a um, different genre, if you like, and different sensibility from herself. But she just put down, we were talking about goth music and talking about how something I've been talking about with Justin like a couple of years previously, where we were listening to this, this is a mercy. And, and we said, this, this is, this is wild. The fact that the guitar sounds horrible, the bass sounds horrible, the drum machine sounds horrible, his voice, his voice sounds horrible, but, but put it all together and it sounds great. So we were just marveling at that. So I realized that Diane had, had been a bit of a goth when she was a kid. And anyway, so she put down some finger drums and then I came up with that bass line, which is the verse of Speed of the Night Time. And then the bridge part as well which is another bass riff and then from there i took it to dan and then dan fleshed that out and started to make those into more kind of guitar parts but based around the bass riff and then he added uh, drop down curtis and then i took it to justin so it was three three different collaborations and then with justin he surprisingly enough um did the opposite of what he normally does. You know, he really tuned into it and was very restrained and singing in a lower register in the verses and bridge. And then he didn't really let rip until the chorus. Anyway, I think it turned out okay. It's, it's us experimenting, you know, it's not normally what we do, that kind of style, but it's good to try everything once. Yeah, that was actually going to be one of my questions because that song, indeed, it, it's perhaps not something you would immediately expect on a The Darkness record, but it's certainly a cool track. And um, is it kind of, is that something you might do more in the future? Because I'm not sure if you're the band that kind of, you know, uh, experiments a lot more with your sound, but in this track you, you did, I guess. Uh, was it kind of a fun experience for you or? I think so. We do argue a lot, not like throwing plates at each other or anything, but we do try to keep everyone happy with the song. I guess one of the processes that a piece goes through or a video or anything is that we all really have to be kind of happy or at least pretend to be happy with the finished product. And that's quite difficult because apart from anything else, we're different generations. Rue is pretty much half my age, 
well, no, he's less than half. He's more than half my age, sorry, but not far away from there. And there's an age gap to um, Dan and Justin as well with me. So we do basically spend two generations, three generations, you could say, almost three generations. And as well as that, we have different music tastes, but that's good, I think, because it creates it's the opposite of an echo chamber. And one of the biggest problems with, as people have discovered in the last year and a half, is the danger of echo chambers and the way that social media encourages that and feeds into that. They talked about how the CIA, one of the reasons uh, why the CIA has such a disastrous record of setting out to achieve their goals, such as you would think it wouldn't be that hard for them to get rid of Fidel Castro, and they couldn't do it. And the reason is, is because why there were such clans over like 30 years and people made fun of them is because um, they were all a very similar profile of person. They were all wasps, W-A-S-P. They were white, educated, privileged Americans uh, who'd gone to the same universities, come from the same backgrounds. They all came from respectable suburban childhoods, respectable parents. And because of that, they weren't able to think outside the box. They were all just echoing each other's thoughts. And they had the same blind spots. So it was just one huge collective blind spot, which um, meant they couldn't. Anyway, I'm using that as a metaphor really to really say that good management or good group mentality is actually the difficult one where you're actually arguing with each other. And, but you can think of the arguing as a negative thing or you can think it's a positive thing because you're actually pushing each other and being forced to rethink and reassess things. So it's very creative, I think. Yeah. And I guess there's not really that much space for egos anyway when you're creating music or it shouldn't be, I guess. No, well said. I couldn't agree with you more. The, the singers allowed to have a bit of an ego thing because that's part of the singer, especially in a cock rock band. <laughs> but Justin is not like that at all. He's actually surprisingly humble and modest. I think most people can see that, you know, when he when you see his personality on stage and when he's talking in between songs, he doesn't take himself seriously. And I think um, that's a to me that's a crucial thing. In, when it comes to the ego, is that ability to be able to laugh at yourself. And he certainly is, you know. So, yeah. on that front, I think we have healthy, we have healthy relationships with our egos, hopefully. Now, it's been, I guess, 10 years since The Darkness reunited and with its original lineup and that you just rejoined the band. How do you look back to these 10 years that you, you were back? with them on stage and such. Yeah, you're right, 10 years, 2011. Good research. <laughs> I would say we, we look back, I look back, sorry, you're asking me, Ernie. Well, it's mixed, there's frustration sometimes. I would say what I've learned is that the management is crucial. We, we've had three sets of management since we reformed and we're on to our third set of management and i can't stress just how reassuring and stable and peace of mind you know the peace of mind that you have with good management that you trust that you like that make good 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 calls every time and before that i don't want to dish the dirt but the two different um management groups that looked after us before that between 2011 and 2015 or 16, I think it was. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. I would say it was mismanaged, actually, the comeback because of this. We don't really like to talk about that. And maybe I'm speaking out of line by bringing it out in public, but I'm just talking from my point of view. I find it um, horrific. It was a horrible feeling to be misrepresented and to have decisions made over our heads. Now, now we have fantastic communication. 
respect and attitude and intelligence. People with brains looking after us. Yeah, that's really important indeed, because I guess a healthy workplace is, you know, I guess kind of the key to success as well. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, I noticed because, you know, I'm originally from Belgium and uh, when you guys started out, you were huge here when you released Permission to Land and you play a lot of shows. But in Finland, it seems like you guys only come sometimes during summer. There haven't been any venue shows in quite a while. Is that somehow in the works or what is the situation there? I haven't looked at the itinerary for next summer's festivals. There probably will be one in Finland. Have you checked our European tour in January, February? Are we playing in Finland? No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Or at Surprising. Least according to what I checked, but maybe I didn't see the date or something. <laughs> okay. Well, if not, uh, all I can say is that putting together, in these difficult times, putting together an, an itinerary that works and that works financially is extremely difficult. So there might be other reasons for that. Normally we would do Finland. Helsinki is normally something that we would do. I mean, Scandinavia is difficult because of the large distances between places. But if we're not doing Finland, I'm sure there's a very good reason for it. It's probably logistical, I'm sad to say. But I would double check because I I seem to recall we were. I, I know we're doing Scandinavia. So I would, if we're doing Scandinavia and not Finland, then that's quite unusual. But if, if we're not doing Finland in January, February, then there's a good chance we'll have a Finnish festival next, next summer. What can people expect from the tour you're going to do? Because uh, part of your Easter is cancelled tour got cancelled, of course, due, or postponed due to Corona. Are you still playing some songs from that side as well and from the new record? Or what's your set list going to look like? Oh, there's definitely going to be more of the new record than the last one, for sure. Because these songs are fresh with us and also they really are suited to live performance because they basically came from from jams you know uh, but i think what they do is they really express all the pent-up energy and frustrations you know of being in lockdown so these are our are, are guys who are these songs represent guys who are just chomping at the bit pent-up frustrated and just ready to go wild you know and they're instinctive and everything so i really think that um people are gonna appreciate the energy and i think they're gonna go down great live you know we'll rotate which ones we do from the new album during the tour but we'll probably do four or five new ones we won't do the whole album like last time but um, um, we'll probably do a couple from easter is cancelled too and then obviously our greatest hits yeah yeah, it's actually interesting you mentioned the like the frustration that went behind it because in my opinion the the record like it sounds so positive in a way and it sounds very fun. So it's great that you're offering people kind of a fun listening experience where they can kind of forget about the world in a way. Yeah, I think so. I think by in instinctively we tend to be contrarian and go and go against the grain. Yeah. And I think that was never more important than now because nobody wants to hear, you know, during lockdown that our job, the darkness's job is to do that, you know, it's, it's not to wallow in mediocrity and, and complain about how awful things are, you know, no, nobody wants to hear that. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, I guess that's it for my questions. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share with Finnish people out there who are fan or... I used to have a Finnish girlfriend and she told me she used to blush when she saw my big ears because she told me that in Finland the uh, big ears is a sign of the libido 